He's one of the world's most notorious mass murderers and the personification of pure evil. Maybe I should have killed four or five hundred people, then I would have felt better. Four decades ago, Charles Manson and his ragtag band of followers embarked on a killing spree that will never be forgotten. She asked me to let her baby live. I told her that I didn't have any mercy on her. These were the most nightmarish murders in the recorded annals of American crime. Although Manson was locked up years ago, compelling mysteries remain unanswered. Was the family's body count much higher than court records show? Did this cult of killers leave behind a trail of buried bodies still waiting to be found? Oh, possibly there's more victims, sure. Well, it's clear that there's a lot of murders that we can attribute to him. Manson was convicted of nine murders, but he's believed to be responsible for 35. We've reopened the case files, dug through the evidence lockers, and tracked down Manson's former followers in search of the truth. I think anyone who crossed their paths was definitely a danger of being killed. With the aid of police investigators, cadaver dogs, and forensic scientists, we've scoured Manson's hideouts for clandestine grave sites. All right, you have an anomaly there on fix eight. We'll mark that. It's a cold case trail of murder, intrigue, and long lost secrets. Stay with us for Manson's missing victims. Dosty and his dog Buster walk a creekside trail in the rugged hills above Los Angeles. It's an idyllic scene, except that Dosty is a police sergeant, Buster's a cadaver dog, and this peaceful looking sight once emanated pure evil. Let's go find it. We've brought them here because Paul believes the trail may lead to buried bodies, murder victims dumped 40 years ago by a sadistic death squad led by Charlie Manson. My interest was other murders that they may have been responsible for that have not really been thoroughly looked into. People disappeared from the Spawn Ranch during the time the Manson family was here. So it's quite possible that one or more of those people are buried in this area. Above the creek is a field where the Spawn Ranch once stood and where Manson launched the gruesome carnage that shocked the world. Today, all that remains of the old ranch is a burnt fence post and some old bricks but Paul's relying on Buster's keen sense of smell to lead him to an underground world of long forgotten bones. Until it was destroyed by fire in 1970, the Spawn Ranch was a Western set seen in countless movies and TV shows. But by the late 60s, Westerns were fading and the ranch was run down. They still rented horses to people. Kids go horseback riding. And that's where the Manson family ended up. And they ended up uh, pretty much taking over much of the Spawn Ranch. Manson was very uh, clever about how he wormed his way uh, in there. The owner uh, was George Spawn, who was 83 years old and was blind. And Manson assigned a couple of the women uh, to George, and they would cook uh, for him, clean, sleep with him. And he thought things were great. Manson, a 32-year-old career criminal, had been released from prison a year earlier, just in time for the hippie's summer of love. Armed with a guitar, acid, and a con man's charisma, he assembled a cult following, mostly young runaway girls susceptible to his 60s psycho-mystic patter. Who is Charlie Manson? He's your brother. He's your father, and he's your little boy. He's all men. I was 17 years old, and uh, I was fascinated by him. It was just people loving each other and taking care of each other. And um, in the middle of all this, seemed to be a person that cared more than anybody else. It was a very light atmosphere when I, when I first joined the family. Being as, as it was a movie set at Spawns, we pretended we were pioneers or we pretended we were mountain folk. 
and everything was a game. It was us, like little birds with our mouths open, beat us, and he would be saying the things we, we had been thinking. We thought that he had an end to our very thoughts and our very hearts, and so we'd listen to him every night. But it wasn't long before the talk turned dark and twisted. Manson was a Hitler-loving racist who used the Bible and Beatles lyrics to concoct an Armageddon prophecy he called Helter Skelter. Manson had a theory of Helter Skelter, and that was that there would be a war between the blacks and the whites. The blacks would ultimately win, but they wouldn't be smart enough to run the world, so they would need Manson and his followers to run the world for them. As time went on, it got more intense. The discussions of Helter Skelter were pretty much constant. In Manson's deranged scenario, the country would become a battleground, but the family would be safe in a magical underground land he called the bottomless pit. Manson believed that the entrance was through Death Valley. What they believed uh, was going to happen in the bottomless pit, that they were going to live there for 50 to 100 years. And in that period of time, they would grow to 144,000, like the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is where our sordid story becomes a tale of two ranches. 250 miles from their lair at Spawn, the family had a second home, the remote Barker Ranch, hidden in the hills above Death Valley. Like nomads, they spent months going back and forth from Spawn to Barker, avoiding authority and searching for the entrance to the bottomless pit. But the bloody revolution he predicted never happened. And the longer Manson waited, the angrier he became. Manson was getting impatient with the blacks starting the revolution. And he said, uh, somebody's going to have to show him how to do it. On a summer weekend in August 1969, Charlie decided it was time to show them. He sent out a team of assassins to slaughter rich whites and lay the blame on blacks. The horror story that followed is familiar to every American. Manson's murderous team would spend the next two nights savagely butchering seven people, including movie star Sharon Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant, and wealthy supermarket tycoon Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary. But the story you may not know is that the Manson family murders weren't contained to just two nights of terror. A few weeks before the Tate LaBianca murders, Manson violently confronted musician Gary Hinman after a drug deal gone bad. So I said, now you do what I say. And he said, no. I said, you do exactly what I say. And he said, no. I'm telling you, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, you do exactly what I say. As illustrated by this actual courtroom model retrieved from the DA's evidence locker, Manson brutally slashed Hinman's ear then on Charlie's orders, three family members killed him. Next on the family's hit list, a spawn ranch hand named Shorty Shea, who'd rubbed Manson the wrong way. He met Manson and the family and immediately knew that they were up to no good and, and dedicated himself to trying to get them kicked off the ranch. And that was his downfall. Manson was upset when Shorty married a black woman, and he blamed him for a police raid on Spawn Ranch for stolen cars. Manson and some of the other people thought that he was an informant who gave us the information to uh, serve a search warrant at the ranch, and that's not true. Charlie and two others tortured and killed Shea, bringing the official Manson total to nine. But even after Charlie was put away, the family continued to kill. Charlie claimed they killed 35 people, Prominent Manson girl Sandra Good said it was 35 to 40. Oh, possibly there's more victims, sure. There's a dozen or, or two dozen that they've been linked to, but nobody's ever been able to successfully pin the homicides on them. So who might the other victims be? The list has tentacles that reach from Los Angeles to Death Valley and all the way to London. Ronald Hughes, Leslie Van Houten's attorney, died mysteriously while camping. During a break in the Tate LaBianca trial, Hughes had argued with Manson, and at least two family members said his death was a retaliation murder. I remember we broke, and it was a Friday about 4 o'clock, and Manson pointed across the counsel table at Hughes and said, Attorney, I don't want to ever see you in this courtroom again. And we never saw him in the courtroom again. 
In 1972, family associate James Willett was found shot and decapitated in the woods north of San Francisco. These rarely seen photographs include his wife, Lauren, who was found buried in the basement of a house rented by two Manson girls. Another family cohort, John Philip Haught, known as Zero, supposedly shot himself while playing Russian roulette in the presence of other family members. But the gun was fully loaded. Poor odds for such a deadly game. Biker Filippo Tenerelli, who had family ties, was found shotgunned in Bishop, one of the larger towns near Death Valley. It's widely suspected the Manson family was um, part of that uh, killing as well. Tenerelli's vehicle was found 100 miles away from Bishop on the way to the Barker Ranch, covered in blood. Joel Pugh, Sandra Good's husband, was found dead in London. Police called his slit throat a suicide. Was it just a coincidence that family member Bruce Davis, convicted in the Hinman and Shea murders, was also in London at the time? The list goes on and on. Rumors and stories of possible Manson victims buried in clandestine graves at both the Spawn and Barker ranches. Check up here. Everywhere the family went, bodies seemed to surface in their wake. Paul Dosty believes Buster can help find them. We're down behind where the main Spawn Ranch buildings are now in, uh, in kind of a gully. There's a little stream bed here, and there's a flat area. Uh, there's a circle of rocks that he slowed down, was a little interested in it, so I'm going to detail search him, which means I'm just going to really have his nose on the ground and carefully go through that area just to see if there's any scent that uh, he may be interested in there. So, Buster, you ready to work some more? OK, let's go find it. The Manson family was a cult of cold-blooded killers. They murdered without hesitation or remorse. They enjoyed killing, and they wanted to kill as many people as possible. Maybe I should have killed four or 500 people, then I would have felt better. Two years after the Tate killings, Manson and family loyalists Tex Watson, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Susan Atkins, also known as Sadie, would each be convicted on multiple counts of murder. At a 1993 parole hearing, a visibly shaken Susan Atkins recounted Sharon Tate's last moments alive. What'd she say? Yes. What'd she say? I overheard Sadie describing the murders. She said Sharon Tate was the last to die because she had to watch the others die first. The crime scene uh, at the Tate house defied uh, belief. The victims were stabbed a total of 102 times. Manson, Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten would also be charged in the gruesome murders of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. Tex handed me a knife, and he said, do something. I went back in the bedroom, and Mrs. LaBianca was laying on the floor on her stomach, and I stabbed her numerous times in the back. I wrote, um, with his blood on the walls of the refrigerator. The bloody Manson buzzwords, rise, death to pigs, and helter-skelter, would ultimately help prosecutors convict all the defendants in both cases. 11 Manson family victims are known and their killers put away. But Paul Dosty believes there are more skeletons in their dark closet. If he's right, how could they have chalked up murders that remain unsolved to this day? In the year 1969, there was no national database for missing persons no computers and uh, no DNA. Compared to what we see on CSI shows today, solving a murder case 40 years ago was primitive. Shorty Shea is a case in point. Manson and two others were convicted of Shorty's murder, even though his body couldn't be found. We had several different people giving us different locations, and we searched all the places that we uh, were told about. But nothing turned up. 
In fact, it took Bill Gleason eight years and an important confession to find the remains. Eventually, one of the defendants in his murder case told us the location of where he was, and then I and my partner eventually dug him up on December 15th of 1977. We're about a quarter mile south of the Spawn Movie Ranch on Santa Susana Pass Road. The area we're at now is where uh, Shorty Shea was killed and his body dumped over down the bank. He slid quite a ways and went down in this area over here. And then they came back and covered him up later that night. Without the tip, Shorty's body may have remained buried forever. But if the Manson family killed and buried Shea so close to where they lived, Paul Dosty believes it's possible they did the same with others. The Spawn Ranch was searched at the time, but not with an eye to more victims. I think the investigators at the time had their hands full dealing with the multiple murders. And after they were sentenced to death, there was really no reason to go any further. So we brought Paul to the side of the ranch with his dog, Buster, to try to uncover the truth. Since my interest is in homicide investigation, I thought it'd be a good match for someone who's a detective who's interested in homicide investigation to have a cadaver dog or an HRD dog. HRD stands for Human Remains Detection, something dogs are uniquely equipped for. The shape and length of a dog's nose gives them superior scenting ability. Their nostrils have slits on the sides. When they sniff, the air comes in the front and is exhaled out the sides. That allows a high volume of scent to enter. While the human nasal cavity has 5 million scent receptors, a canine has more than 300 million and the ability to distinguish between thousands of different chemical scents. The other half of the equation that is equally important is the dog's brain. A significant portion of his brain is devoted to interpreting the information that the nose collects. And when we look at the lab equipment, for instance, the mass spectrometer, that can detect these things down perhaps to parts per billion. The dogs can detect these uh, substances in parts per trillion. So there's no machine made by man that can do what the dog can do. Dosty and his dog are a cold case team. They recently helped locate and recover the remains of a murdered California woman who'd been missing for eight years. Dogs can be trained to sniff out drugs, explosives, or in Buster's case, human remains. Go find. Paul even trains him in 100-year-old cemeteries, and there's a reason. While most cadaver dogs are trained to find relatively recent graves marked by soft tissue decomposition, Buster specializes in searching for old graves through bone decomposition. We have different commands, and we don't want to get their commands confused. So um, Buster's command for human remains detection is find Fred. Buster, are you ready to work? Are you ready to work? You are? Buster, find Fred. <laughs> When Buster alerts, he lays down and points his nose at the scent source. This is Buster's way of communicating to me that he has found the target odor of human remains. Buster's reward, his favorite toy. Good boy! We're hoping Buster can tell us if there are bodies hidden at the Spawn Ranch. The family's early days at Spawn played out like a 60s peace and love fantasy. Well, when I first met him, the man talked to me, and he says, I uh, want you to come up, and uh, the rules are that, you know, there is no rules. You just look at it, just be beautiful with it, and it's just beautiful to you. But the beautiful life turned into a brutal life, and knowing that Shorty Shea was buried here opens the very real possibility that others are buried here as well. Go for it, friend. This clearing behind the old buildings is flat and hidden from view, a perfect place for hiding a body. There's also a mysterious circle of rocks and cryptic carvings on the trees. Paul is especially interested in the possibility that babies may be buried here. I was able to contact a witness who worked here as a ranch hand, and she told me that they put the babies out into the elements uh, without clothing. Charlie had a theory about raising children that that would toughen the babies up. Well, she told me that she personally picked up one dead baby here. And when she told them that there was a dead baby outside, she was told that the baby would be buried with the other babies. 
So Buster's been kind of circling this tree and uh, really putting his nose up and uh, up high here in the crotch of this tree. So we don't know what uh, what's going on. He's checking things out, but it's an area of interest for him. But frankly, what will happen when we have these types of nests, which just appears to be like a pack rat's nest, that the rats will take little finger and toe bones and hide them in their nests. So I'm just going to pull this apart real quick and see if we find anything in here that he's interested in. Go check again. What's up? Boy. So probably what it is is plant decomposition materials. What I'm seeing is there's some really decomposed plants in there. So he's checking that out, and he says, nope, it's not quite what I'm looking for. Some decomposing plants give off similar scents to decomposing bodies. So when Buster does alert, Paul sends soil samples to a lab to sort out the differences. In the meantime, Buster's hit on something. So Buster's very interested in this area right here. Um, he actually dug a little bit and uh, tells me there's some kind of scent that he's interested in. He's trying to work it out. The environment can play a major role in Buster's ability. We, we're looking at these difficult desert conditions to work in. Uh, we want to get the optimum type of dog to do this. And it's quite simply a dog with a big, wet nose. Many of these Volt organic compounds are polymers, and they're very slippery. And they don't stick inside the dog's nose in low humidity, so that big, wet nose helps to trap those compounds. Since dry conditions like these make it tough for underground scent to percolate upwards, Paul tries to make it easier for Buster to do his job. So what I'm going to do is use this uh, drill uh, that I made and attempt to drill down in the dirt to allow more scent come up. So uh, this spot that I'm going to drill now is a place where Buster seemed the most interested, uh, that he actually scratched. So it's about 16 inches to right here. So we'll see. OK. We'll go get Buster and uh, see what he has to say. Okay, so I'm gonna make Buster start on the farther holes and work his way in and see what he does. Okay, Buster, let's go fight. Come on, check. Check. Let's check here. Oh, there's another one. Let's check here. Oh boy. So he likes that hole. He does not like any of these other ones. Paul marks the spot with a GPS locator. Mark it. That's going to be waypoint number five. Then breaks out the shovel. I'm going to go probably at least a foot here to get down um, what the dogs detect are these volatile organic compounds. And the closest to the surface you are, they're evaporating pretty fast. So if we can get down to depth, we can get a, a better sample where they're more contained and hopefully um, more concentrated if there is indeed something here. OK, so now we'll get a sample. Looks like it's about 18 inches down. The next thing I need to do is take a negative control sample from up here, where we, he is not interested at all. Following forensic protocol, Paul will send soil samples to the lab from the sites that interested the dog and from the sites that did not for scientific analysis and comparison. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee might seem like an unlikely waypoint in the search for missing Manson victims from California. But there are scientists here who specialize in the chemistry of human decomposition. And Paul Dosty has sent them soil samples from the Spawn Ranch. Analytical chemist Dr. Mark Wise is conducting the tests. This is one of the soil samples that Buster, the canine, alerted on. First, we're going to heat it. That will drive any adsorbed organic chemicals off of the soil particles into the head space of the vial. And then we'll take a small sample of that head space and inject it into our analyzer, which is a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. As a person decomposes, the body breaks down into very simple organic compounds. Many of those are in the vapor form. Many of those chemicals, even in a body that is buried in the soil two or three or four feet deep, will actually permeate up and actually reach the surface of the earth. And those are the chemicals that the dogs are actually smelling with their noses. 
The lab's sophisticated instruments take over where Buster leaves off, breaking the vapors down into measurable quantities. This is the sample that was collected at the site where Buster alerted 18 inches below the surface. They appear to be organic chemicals that have oxygen in them, and there's also a couple of constituents that are essentially aromatic hydrocarbons. And all of those constituents could be consistent with the presence of buried remains. Overall, the results are intriguing, and Dr. Wise advises Paul to take more samples from the spawn site. It's not the first time he and Dosti have been on the hunt for Manson victims. They first began in 2008 at the Barker Ranch near Death Valley. The Barker Ranch is located in the Panamint Range between Death Valley and Panamint Valley. It's very rugged and uh, it's very desolate. And really, the way I like to describe it, there's no one to hear you scream there. 20 miles off the nearest paved road, Barker is where the Manson family fled after the Tate LaBianca murders in 1969. Hiding from the law, Manson's mood was ominous. The atmosphere was very heavy. Everyone was paranoid, especially Charlie. There wasn't the fun anymore. It was more like preparing for an imminent war. I know he beat me one night, and he started beating people. and. In your mind, you think, well, maybe he's doing this for our own good, because your whole belief system is that he knows everything, he knows best, and he's the one that will save us. I believe it was perfect for Manson and how he operated. There was no authority there. They ran around naked. Uh, they dug holes to hide equipment and uh, gasoline, food, you know for Helter Skelter. But Paul believes they also dug graves. One is a girl uh, that was not fitting in. Uh, Charlie and Tex allegedly took her for a walk and came back an hour later without her. Another uh, a case was a boy that was backpacking the length of Death Valley, stayed a couple nights at the Barker Ranch. One day he was gone, but his backpack was still there. And uh, when one of the girls asked Steve Grogan where he was, he simply said uh, he got homesick. And there may be others. Susan Atkins told a cellmate that there were three people done in out in the desert. She later told of three bikers who'd given her a ride to Barker after the Tate LaBianca murders. Charlie looked at me and said, what are you doing? Why did you bring them here? And I said, I want my son. I want to talk to you. And he took me off one direction. And Tex Watson, Steve Grogan, and Juan took the other three men and went in another direction. And I never saw the other three men again. During the police raid on Barker, Steve Grogan was arrested sleeping on a tarp with a sawed-off shotgun. He later told a cellmate that a body was buried under the tarp. Here's a guy responsible for, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 murders. In, uh... Ed Sanders, author of The Family, one of the definitive Manson books, wrote that there are supposed to be three bodies buried about eight feet deep behind Barker Ranch. Well, if he had a motive to kill somebody, uh... Hypothetically, it would have been just because they were going to leave the ranch, and he might have been worried that if he didn't trust them, that they might have informed on him. I, I think anyone who crossed their paths was definitely at danger of being killed. The place could be strewn with bodies would not surprise me. The digging is incredibly easy. There's virtually no rock. With all these stories still haunting the ranch, Paul took Buster there on several occasions once with Sharon Tate's sister, Deborah, who's made it her mission to keep track of the Manson family. I believe that there are definitely bodies buried out at Barker. The reasons I believe that are because various core members have made reference to that many, many times over the last 38 years. The ranch itself is little more than a one-room desert cabin filled with Manson remnants and artifacts left by those who still feel a morbid attraction to the family. There's more to Barker Ranch than you will ever know. But Buster had his own take on the ranch. Go fight for on our first trip, it was what we would call a speculative search. We didn't know there was anything there, but 15 minutes into the search, Buster had an alert. My friend. 
More trips led to more alerts, and Paul eventually confirmed five distinct sites. He sent soil samples to Oak Ridge, where they caught the attention of Dr. Arpad Vaz, a world-renowned forensics expert specializing in chemicals associated with human decomposition. We've been doing this type of analysis for many years, and we've looked at many locations worldwide and, and worked on a number of cases on a worldwide basis. After analyzing the soil samples, Vass felt there was enough basis to merit a scientific expedition to Barker with Dr. Wise and others. In April 2008, they began their on-site exploration of the five possible grave sites. We were looking at uh, very confined depths based on where the ground penetrating radar and the magnetometers indicated anomalies were located. But finding bodies that may have been buried decades ago is still an inexact science. The process of decomposition is an effort to liquefy the body. Uh, this comes in two cycles. Uh, one is where the enzymes of the body begin the digestive process and the second is where the bacteria that are either in or on the body then feed on those products uh, with an effort, uh, with an undertaking of trying to liquefy uh, the remains. As the flesh liquefies, it forms what scientists call a scent pool. Depending on the type of soil, this pool can spread and flow like water underground. If a body is buried on a hill, the scent pool can migrate downward Areas around the Barker Ranch are subject to flash floods, which could spread the pool even further. It could go through the body and transport it to a low spot, and that's where the dogs will alert. In other words, when Buster alerts on a cadaver scent, he may actually be off by some distance. So that's why it's important to use a multidisciplinary approach to clandestine grave location, with the dog being the first um, indicator for us, but certainly not the last. At Barker, the scientific team used an arsenal of high-tech instruments on the five potential burial sites. Normal procedure is to follow up the alert with other technologies like ground penetrating radar, like magnetometers, like soil resistivity measurements. If no evidence to support the dog is detected, then the search area typically expands out from that alert region realizing that Oda does migrate. You got a pretty good hit on the acetone here. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. After three days of compiling data, the scientists feed it all into a computer. Is the size of that uh, artifact uh, sufficient to contain a body in terms of... Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and the findings are compelling. The scientists believe Buster is on target. With forensic, canine, and scientific results in hand, the local sheriff is ready to order an official Barker Ranch dig. May 2008, 21st century science is about to take a run at what may be a 20th century boneyard. An army of scientists and law enforcement officers have descended on the Manson family's last hideout, the Barker Ranch in Death Valley, where many believe they left murder victims behind. Today is the first day for digging at the Barker Ranch. It's an accumulation of uh, over a year of investigation on my part, my canine buster. And very nervous, to tell you the truth. Uh, apprehensive, we hope we find something. We hope we're not wrong. But most of all, we hope that we're not just a few feet off where we dig. It'll be a two-day dig, so a small tent city has been set up. We're camping in Charlie's front yard, and uh, actually not very far from one of the first sites we're going to uh, dig. Um, sleeping right next to dead people, it's an eerie feeling. This dig isn't what you might expect. The county sheriff has limited the number of days and the size of the sites to be dug. Additionally, Dr. Vass, Dr. Wise, and the other scientists are forensic specialists, which means they must follow slow and arduous evidence collecting procedures. They will be um, removing soil about one inch at a time over the excavation areas, looking for any evidence of uh, human remains or any artifacts in the soil that might be uh, related to a crime scene. Well, we're down about three inches. <laughs> because the dig is on national park land, they lose one of their potential grave sites almost immediately. They made it less than a foot, and they found some uh, arrowhead chips. 
The archaeologist uh, that was present declared that an archaeological site and no further digging was allowed. At the remaining sites, it's painstaking and frustrating work. They're only allowed to dig a few feet at each site. By the end of the day, we had not found anything in the uh, Buster Four site. This is the site that uh, Dr. Vass felt the most positive about. So we were pretty disappointed. Um, however, with the limited size of the pits we were allowed to dig, uh, this one was probably uh, three by six. Um, you never know, it could be a, a foot down or a few feet to the left or right. The second day is more of the same. The remaining sites are dug to a shallow depth, but turn up nothing. There has been no human remains found um, or anything to lead us to, to uh, any decomposition at this point. Um, we're going to be finishing up this site, and uh, that'll be it. Unfortunately, we did not find what we were looking for. The uh, handheld sensors that the Oak Ridge National Laboratory brought um, continued to indicate the presence of chemicals associated with human decomposition. Where we are now, we really don't know what we have or don't have there. It may continue to be a mystery. But Paul and others were troubled by the limitations of the Barker operation, especially the depths they were allowed to dig. The holes were, were small. Uh, they did not exceed the depth of three and a half feet, and they were generally three by six. And uh, I personally would like to see bigger, deeper holes. Uh, like in any search, when you don't find it in the immediate search area, expand the search area. Unfortunately, what was very frustrating is that it was called off at that point. I refer to it, quite frankly, as a token dig. Susan Adkins had confessed to her cellmate that there were killings at Barker Ranch. She said that Charlie had them dig the holes for the bodies eight feet down. The sheriff's office called the results conclusive proof that there are no bodies. Primarily, we found rocks, we found sage, um, and dirt. That's, that's been pretty much it. And ruled out any further excavation, but Paul remains frustrated. Dr. Bass was very perplexed by the uh, results of the dig. Um, he felt very sure that there were bodies at those locations. I think we have abundant probable cause to investigate further, and that would be uh, a larger excavation, digging these things out 10 feet deep, 12 by 12, and finding out what that scent source is. Back at Spawn Ranch, it's a different story. Paul brings in another cadaver dog to back up Buster's findings. From LA Search Dogs, this is Kazam and his handler, Agneta. It doesn't take Kazam long to find something. I have an alert. That's good. And that is uphill from the site where we had Buster did. So we're still probably about 15, 20 feet away. So that's a good thing. We know there's something in here. Yeah, there is definitely something in here. How, how Kassam works is when he has sand, he has strong sand, he goes and checks the negatives to yeah. make sure that he has the strongest sand. Right. So that's why you see him going around. But there's definitely high interest in, in here. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. That's exactly what Buster did. We probed it. Uh -huh. And he ended up alerting right here. OK. Um, <clears throat> and we did have uh, some of the chemicals that we look for in human decomposition. OK. So, this is a really good indication. We now have two dogs alerting within 20 feet of each other down here at this site. Then Paul brings Buster down to see if he alerts in the same location he did before. OK, when Buster came down, he uh, came into this area. He was in scent right away and ultimately alerted at the base of the tree, which is about five feet from his original alert site. Uh, the sand will tend to pool in these trees and uh, when there's something close by, he alerted on his original site, and then he alerted uh, over on the edge over here. So everything is within this, uh, where the dogs either showed interest or alerted, are within this circle of rocks that we see here, the very discernible circle of rocks. So that's a really good area for us to grab our samples from and see if we can pinpoint it some more. 
while Paul marks off the area. Agneta and another volunteer probe the soil. It's finally dropping through into oh, a hole. Here. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's a good sign. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Buster alluded right there, so. It's a, it's a pocket, um, it's soft dirt, so when you dig a grave, you put the dirt back in. It takes a quite a long time to be compacted. Based on the dog's alerts, Paul collects more soil samples for Dr. Vaz. He also collects plant samples to be tested. He wants to be sure they're not giving off the chemical scent the dogs are alerting on. But the fact that a second dog has confirmed Buster's hits is a positive sign. Are we closer to new clues in this old mystery? At the Spawn Ranch, the Manson family's old hideout, Paul Dosty continues his search for buried human remains. The last time we were here, we brought in an additional human remains detection dog to search this area where Buster is previously alerted. The dog alerted in this area right here, as well as Buster. And uh, we took soil samples from these holes and sent them to Dr. Vass at the Oak Ridge Lab National Laboratory, and he found chemicals that are associated with bone decomposition. The problem is that the site's at the bottom of a wash and next to a creek, which occasionally overflows. With that much water movement, it's hard to tell how far the scent pool may have flowed downhill, especially after 40 years. We believe, based on this hole right here being exceptionally strong with chemicals associated with human bone decomposition, that the body lies somewhere up here. To further narrow the search zone, we've brought in ground penetrating radar, or GPR, to locate any underground anomalies that might indicate a body. What we have here is a small antenna that transmits radio signals into the ground. Those radio signals are reflected from subsurface objects. Those objects can be rocks, can be trees, can be bodies, and so on. That information is then transmitted by this cable to this monitor system that acquires the data and displays it in real time. We will be detecting targets. They may or may not be the bodies, but at least those targets give you an, an area where you can go and look. Paul will pull the antenna unit while Dick monitors and records the data. They'll measure in two-foot widths. With two-foot lines, we probably have about 95 to 98 percent coverage down to a depth of 10 feet. All right. A little slower, Paul. This is a ground surface right here. Here's kind of a uniform soil layer. And then below that, at about a five and a half, six feet depth, there's another soil layer. And our target should be in this upper four or five feet, would expect. And we should see a small blip or a hyperbola. They cover a wide area of ground, not just the spots where Buster and the other dog showed interest, but uphill and downhill from the alert sites as well. We have to remember that the dogs alert where the scent is the strongest, and that necessarily may not be where the body is. But just above the large oak tree, in an area that both Buster and Kazam alerted on, Dick spots something on the monitor. All right, you have an anomaly there on fix eight. We'll mark that. OK, so the target I'm looking at is right here. You can see the change in the reflectivity, the darkness of the upper layer. Paul marks the site with a flag. OK, this spot is uh, uphill from the location where the dogs alerted and a direct line down kind of a little gully. So right in this area here, we had an anomaly on the radar system. So uh, it would have to be, be the place you're going to dig, yeah. A labor crew is here to dig the site targeted by the GPR. They hike into the canyon with handheld tools because there's no road to bring in heavy equipment. We're going to use this flag as ground zero. And to start off with, we like to dig about three feet either direction, so about a six-foot square pit, taking it down a couple inches at a time. Um, we want to remove all this uh, organic material, these leaves, probably 20 feet away, so we can put our dirt in a clear spot and we look at it as it comes out of the hole and make sure there's any, no artifacts in there or anything. Our crew rakes the area clear, then starts in with shovels. I think we're about ready for the hammers. Uh, we're just going to start out at a 90 and then get down a little bit and drop to a 45. That should keep us from breaking anything that might be down in there. But as our crew digs deeper, we hit a series of setbacks. First, 
it becomes clear we're not starting at what was ground level during the Manson days. This is Phil. I mean, I, you know, if there's chunks of asphalt down here, they dumped all this asphalt and concrete, and it's, uh, it's everywhere. Spawn Ranch has become private property, and its history is somewhat sketchy. But based on what we now see, it appears that much of the debris from buildings destroyed by the fire was unloaded right here. Multiple layers of soil and rubble. There's no way of telling how deep it goes other than to keep digging. As the hours go by, we keep hitting layer upon layer of fill, and it continues down nearly five feet. With daylight fading and the owners of the property requesting that our crew wrap it up, we have no choice but to call the dig off. It's uh, difficult to assess how much deeper we have to go. Probably taking off three feet is going to get us down to the level they were at in 1969. And if they buried someone, uh, we'd have to go down several feet below that, which would be very difficult to do by hand, and we'd need some heavy equipment. The dig was frustrating, but it doesn't negate the possibility that there are human remains here. And Paul Dosti's commitment to the case never wavers. Whenever we do these types of investigations, we never know what we're going to run into when we start digging. Um, the dog continues to alert. Uh, our chemistry is still good. So I think I'm very encouraged that they're, we're very close to human remains being here. It would just take an extraordinary effort to dig them up using mechanical means. These are brothers and sisters whose sibling or child walked out the door one day never to be heard or seen again. I'm positive that an animal like Buster can be used in this manner to help identify a lot of the mysteries of uh, history. In my experience with HRD canines, the dogs are always in the general area, but rarely exactly where the body is. The actual odor that they alert on is a huge unknown. It's under a great amount of research right now. We've done everything we could here today using the science that we have to try to locate clandestine graves. And it's still uh, not a, a perfect science yet. The science may be inexact, but the mystery is as real as it gets. With multiple cadaver dog alerts and forensic tests confirming their insight, our investigation has raised new questions about missing victims yet to be found. Today, almost four decades after its gruesome unfolding, the Manson case continues to hold a chilling grip on the American psyche. 